guys and girls, it's Tom Panos here. I've got John McGrath, who's going to uh, be my co-host here over the next 45 minutes or so. We're just waiting for this audience to build up. We've got record numbers here coming on. I think we've got close to uh, uh, 800 people that have registered for this webinar with, uh, I would say, uh, John, by the way, uh, 11 years I've been shooting video content uh, with uh, real estate agents, thought leaders, various experts, your videos always get the highest number of views. This is going back to 2007, Johnny. So there's no better person to start the year off with. Thank you. And thank you for the audience for uh, being interested. So let's see okay. if we update all the stuff we've done in the past and give them a fresh look. Absolutely. So Johnny, as this audience is uh, building up, we'll just uh, buy one or two minutes. Um, can I just ask you, you've been, um, uh, 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 you've put a lot of focus on health and fitness. And I just, I said off camera before we came on, um, you look like you've lost five, 10, 15. What, what, how many Ks is it, Johnny? Yeah. Eight to 10, eight to 10 in the last, or just before Christmas. Right. In about, in about uh, 10 weeks. In about 10 weeks. And, uh, you said to me, uh, about two months ago, you played a game that you were going to win, and you said you did. You, you felt it was effortless. It wasn't a grind. It was pretty seamless. Um, I know that. I mean, I know that we're not health and fitness experts, but I do know that a lot of real estate agents highly value the health and fitness aspect of of life. Um, can I ask you, in in a short summary? What, uh, what's the regime that has got you to shed that weight in that time? Yeah, so Tommy, a, a couple of things. One is every, everyone on this call, health should, my view, I don't want to impress my views on people too much, but my view is health should be our number one for everyone. Uh, doesn't matter whether you're 25 or 65 or 75, health should be the number one. Without health, you have nothing. And you can't help people, you can't inspire your kids, you can't make a material difference in the community. So it should be key. Um, Pete Fooder said at Eric last year, you have to play a game that you can win or design a game that you can win. So what does that look like in real estate space? One thing, what does it look like in health space? Another thing. So I kind of, I, I like systems and I like process that I can understand, digest easily. So I just said, look, clearly there's two things that impact your, your, your weight and your health predominantly. It's what do you put into your mouth and how much you move your body, exercise, whatever you're doing. So I said, let's have a look at those two things. So basically I made a decision that I wouldn't eat anything that was man-made. So basically that still gives you a huge array of choice, but it's, it's fish, it's chicken, it's vegetables, it's fruit pretty much. Um, and then if you want to go right to the, the, the great end of the scale, it's organic and free range. So that's kind of even better, um, but without compliment, com, 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 complicating it. Then you've got to drink three litres of water a day or thereabouts. So that's about a glass an hour. So I just kind of made a commitment to every time I went to a meeting, I asked for uh, water and I'd have at least a 250 mil, 300 mil glass of water every, uh, every hour. Um, on, the, on the walking side, I kept it really, really simple. I did 10,000 steps a day just by using the little, it wasn't a Fitbit, just the, the built-in app in, uh, in Apple on the iPhone. 10,000 steps a day, which is about an hour and a half walking, so it's not that hard, 45 minutes in the morning, and then I'd get most of it during the day, and if I didn't, I'd get 45 at the end of the day. Um, I did 120 push-ups a day, um, broken into 20s, 15s actually, so it was eight by 15. And I did uh, stretching, I did 120 stairs. So again, most of those were done in my morning walk. Uh, I've got some stairs around the corner, that, that 60 stairs, it's a good staircase. I did that twice. If I had to get an early flight and I couldn't do that, well then I'd just find a way to do those stairs during the day. That was pretty much it, Tommy. So a couple of key things. One is it's simple. Um, it wasn't complicated. Um, it wasn't about calorie counting and so forth. I just trusted that. Uh, the, the last thing, sorry, was intermittent fasting. Um, which is an important one. Is it uncomfortable? Not really, not really. So intermittent fasting, generally the one that I adopted was the kind of 16-8, which is 16 hours a day you don't eat and then eight hours a day you, you eat. So what does that look like in the real world? It means you have dinner at night, then you don't eat until lunch the next day. That's the easiest way of doing it. Half your 16 hours is taken up in sleep. The other half is just you know doing stuff until you're ready for lunchtime. 
Uh, at one point of it, though, I did move to one meal a day. I don't want to complicate this, though, because I actually found the health benefits and the energy I was getting and the results I was getting from two meals a day were so outstanding. And then I found I was getting to lunch and I actually wasn't that hungry because my body was more efficient. So I then kind of um, found that just having dinner each day for a period of 12 weeks was a good strategy. But even if you don't do that, because some people say for them it's too hardcore, uh, it's not, but if they think that, just go for the 16.8, three litres of water, only man-made food, sorry, only um, no man-made food, which, which cuts out the obvious stuff like pasta, bread, um, those sort of things, and it just says you eat fresh stuff, which is kind of cool. So design a game you can win in life, in health, and in real estate. Okay, beautiful. Um, by the way, John, I've, uh, water is something that I just... I've never loved the taste of it. So it's something that I've got to try hard. I, um, and I've, I've started using that app. You actually told me about it. I think it was ages ago called streaks on your app phone. And what I do is I'm at, uh, I'm at day seven of streaks of drinking two liters of water. So what happens is it, the alert keeps coming up and, um, I'm finding that it's getting easier to drink two liters of water each day. It's fun, isn't it funny how habits get easier each day that you do them? And it, it, there's this compound effect that um, the more you do it, the easier it become, becomes and the better that you feel, but it happens in a invisible way. Well, that's what I found Tom very much during that period and, and now of course the key for all of us is to maintain these things because it's not hard to prospect for a week or diet for a month um, or, or eat better for a month the question is what are you going to do for the rest of your life um, so you have to again design something and create the habit the positive habit that keeps you on track there so i've now got a, a thing in place that i weigh myself once a week and if i go above a certain weight i need to go back to some of the key things that got me then that doesn't mean i eat anything now and i, and I throw it out because i actually eat pretty well eight out of 10, nine out of 10 meals anyway. But it's kind of like in case of emergency, break glass, as Dr. Fred used to say, you need something that says, if you get beyond a point, um, you need to kind of snap back into uh, a, a better level of habit. So yeah, that works well, but you, everyone can apply it, not just to, to health, but it's uh, to work as well. Okay, John, I want to talk about you uh, some dialogue and language at the moment. I, I think one of the most important conversations in 2019 is your ability to not get locked in on a price at a listing presentation and to allow the flexibility for you to have the window open to keep talking about price because invariably in this marketplace, there's going to have to be some price alignment throughout the process. John, you've been... Um, um, very good at explaining at a listing presentation. And I just want to go through it right at the moment. Um, what's the best way a real estate agent can be talking about the issue of price at a listing presentation, but then leave the door open to revisit that based on market intel in the weeks to follow? Yeah, so it's like everything, I think, Tommy, at, at listings, it has a lot to do with your approach and your demeanor. So you need to arrive as an authority. You need to arrive with great product knowledge, but your process is not to paint yourself into a corner. So here's how I start the conversation. You call up, we have a conversation about coming to visit with you and Sula and having a chat about the property. And, and I say, Tom, just one, one, one of the, I guess, areas you're probably gonna to wanna to talk about is what have homes similar to yours been selling for in the area. So I'm gonna do some research and bring it, bring it with me just so I bring the right research, could you give me a sense of what sort of ballpark range you think the, might, the, the property might fall into? And you'll probably, nine out of 10 say to me, oh, well, you know, it's kind of one and a half to 1.6, I think. Some people will say, well, I'm not really sure. That's why I want you there. So then I'll often say, so Tom, I've just done a quick search on, on CoreLogic. There, automatic algorithm that pre-evaluates property through other recent sales is telling me 1650 to 1750. I can research there if you feel that might be around the right ballpark. So again, language Tom is soft. It's not too like, here's the price, you know, what do you think you what do you want for your house? What do you think it's worth? That's too harsh. It's what sort of ballpark do you think? Uh, here's what they're saying, I'll do this research. So 
you're actually starting the conversation. And, and I didn't say one of the things you want to know when I get there is what I think your home's worth. You know, one of the things that we'll discuss when we get there, Tom, is what homes like yours have been selling for so we can kind of understand the lay of the land in terms of the market. So I'll bring some research with me just so I bring the right research. So that's the starting point. Then when you get there, I like to take the pressure off. So Tom, today is not the day you need to decide the value of the property or a reserve price for auction if you decide to take it to auction. Today is the day, I think, where you can get a good feel for who you think is the best agent, who do you click with, and who do you think's got the best plan to maximise your price. But I think it's important that we have a discussion regarding what's happening in the market and what homes like yours have been fetching of late. So again, language is a bit on the soft side. It's not, you know, here's the number one comparable for your property, so it's worth X. So I then lay out three, four, five comparables, like I assume 80, 90% of the audience, and then I have a conversation. And I go through each one, and I'm looking for micro signals from them. I'm looking for body language. I'm, some of it's going to be what they say. Some of it's going to be how they say it. Some of it's going to be their body language response. So I'm looking for kind of how they respond to things and that's kind of helping me understand. So then I say, so look, based on this, Tom, I guess, you know, you said that you thought one six to one eight was what it was worth before I came here. That's correct. Um, I've, I've, I've gone through the comparables. I think you and I are both kind of feeling that it's more likely that buyers will see the lower end of that range is where they feel comfortable. But my job, Tom, is to maximise your price. I'm not about just getting what the market wants to pay for your property. I'm about maximising price. So I've got an eight step plan and I'd love to take you through it that I believe will absolutely maximise your price, whatever that is. So I'm kind of segueing into the, let's talk about process. I've addressed pricing in terms of comparables. Um, I've got your feedback. Now let's take a different scenario, Tom. Let's assume that I brought one six to one eight in my mind, it's kind of early one six to one seven in your saying, well, I don't think I'd sell under one eight which is probably more likely a scenario. It's not an uncommon scenario, put it that way. So I'm saying, so Tom, it's really important for me to understand your target, your goal, what you'd like to achieve. What I'd like to achieve is the most amount possible for your property. And I have a plan to do that. At, at the sort of level you're talking, that would be an outstanding price for the community. In fact, that would be breaking records. And I have no glass ceiling on what I think we might be able to achieve. But just to kind of put it in context is, you know, three or four other homes that the buyers are going to point to and raise with me when I'm selling your property have been selling between one six and one seven. So we just need to be pragmatic that that's the kind of local data, but you and I need to work together to maximize it. And if we're going to give a shot at getting your premium price, which is what I'm goal focused on, we need to work really closely together and we need great marketing, great presentation. So again, I'm not destroying I'm not saying, Tom, 1.8, you're dreaming. This is just like, I'm, I'm, and it also depends on the width. I mean, if they're at 1.9 and the market's at 1.6, it's different. But I'm, I'm assuming most vendors are not that far apart, but they're probably at what, let's call it, the optimistic end of what's likely. And mm. the buyers are going to want to buy it at the conservative end of, of what it should be worth. And it's our job. So I don't try and close that gap totally there and then because I'm likely to lose the business and you're going to think I'm working for the buyer. Um, I also have been around the block enough times to know that sometimes when I think something's worth 1650, I end up yielding 1750 because of the competition and the process and, and stuff happens. And there is no retail price for a property. Everything is really what the buyers are prepared to pay for it. So I think it's, it's around that. And then going forward, Tom, the, the second and, and equally important. So first thing is don't overshoot the runway. Don't pump up their tyres. Don't say, oh, yeah, one eight, no problem. Yeah, we're going to get it. This is a magnificent home. Because then, then you're driving home saying, shit, I got the listing, but, man, I'm never going to get one eight. It's a bad energy to start. So yeah. I, I never paint myself into a corner. Um, and, and I think the vendors actually appreciate that. They don't need to know the final price. They just kind of want to know that you're the best agent and you've had a discussion on price. They kind of know they're probably at the top end and, we don't need to kind of like slam the mosquito with the sledgehammer today. We just need to kind of set it up for success. Then going forward, what's important for me is the frequency and the relevance of the, of the communication. So I'm calling my vendors every day. Uh, I was when I was selling property, calling them every day. Um, most of my colleagues were calling them once a week. Certainly outside of our office, they were. Um, in our office, we had a kind of a once a day uh, policy. 
not a policy once that I have it. Um, so for me, the frequency is important because it tells you that I'm on the job every day thinking about you. If you don't hear from me for three days, you kind of think I'm doing something else. I'm on holidays or I'm selling someone else's property. So you've got to hear from me. Secondly is you have to hear from me in an unfiltered um, way that actually doesn't destroy your, uh, you know, um, your optimism, but it kind of makes sure that you know what the real people are saying about your property. So there's that kind of nice balance, never too high, never too low. If I've got 10 contracts out after the first open, I'm kind of saying, Tom, we had a really good open. I, I think the marketing has really hit the mark and I'm really happy that kind of what you and I set out to achieve a couple of weeks ago when we set up the marketing and you signed off on the marketing investment, it's actually being delivered. And, it's a, and, and I'm feeling very positive about a great start. I, I, you can tell Tom from my tonality, it's measured. It's not over the top. I'm mm. not trying to condition you in the old speak of old language. I hate that. I, I just want to make sure because I know if 20 people ask for a contract, 12 of them are going to go cold by Monday because that's just kind of what happens. People love it. They're excited. They come through. Then they go home. They think about the price. and They got to sell their property and all sorts of things. So I, I'm, I'm kind of factoring in the reality in my experience that says 10 contracts isn't really 10 contracts. It's probably four. So, right, and, but I'm not going to lie to you and say four because that's not what I'm about either. But I am going to kind of just, just, just sort of soften it all and, and sort of bring it back to probably where it's going to end up. Now, by the way, if 10 contracts ends up being 10 and we end up getting you 250,000 more than you ever dreamed of, we're all in a good state. But I need to manage your expectations along the way. So when the right offer, a great offer, a good offer, the best offer comes forward, you're kind of in a position to move because I've seen so many sales lost because the right offer came in and the vendor wasn't at that point for another month. And they miss it and then a month goes by and they get frustrated, they end up switching agents and then another two months goes by and they end up taking 10% less than I had three months before. So really important for both sides. Now, Tom, reverse this with the buyers. I'm equally the same with buyers. Is I'm managing their expectations as well. So if they're making an offer, even if it's a good offer, I'm kind of setting them up to test, are they, is that their highest? Can we make another offer? So I'm saying, Tom, look, thanks very much. Obviously I'm obliged to take every offer to the client and, 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 I, and being totally respectful, I think it's a solid offer and we're in the zone. I do think that, you know, based on the feedback I've had and based on what I would be recommending the vendor takes, we're at the lower end of the zone. I think you need to be contemplating, you know, how far you're prepared to go to own this. But in the meantime, I'm gonna go and have a chat with the vendor. So I'll come back to you. So. I might know that that's a price the vendor is going to be popping the champagne at, but I'm trying to manage your expectations without blowing you out of the water. Um, but I'm trying to make sure that I do my job, which is get the highest price for the vendor, but I don't lose the buyer either. So walking on a tightrope is what we've got to do all day, every day. Too, too upbeat is, neg is, is not good. Too downbeat is not good. It's that middle kind of space. Okay, John, I want to ask you, picture the scenario where it's been one week and um, all of a sudden the interest that's coming in from buyers is on this, let's use this example, um, the, the property guide that you've been talking about and you start getting interest coming in at 1415. Um, a lot of real estate agents, I notice, particularly those that have been brought up in a marketplace where they never had to have uh, a crucial conversation with vendors, they struggle with the concept of actually relaying this number. They, they tiptoe around the number. Um, a lot of the real estate gym members I have say to me, Tom, it's draining having to sit in front of vendors all the time, giving them bad news. What's your view on that? Yeah, great question. Um, so I start with, I'll go back to it. It's how you set it up. So up front, I'll be saying, Tom, what I find is the most successful relationships and results I get is when I have a really transparent relationship with you, where we work as a team, we're in this together, the communication is unfiltered and, and, and it's transparent. So me, rather than me trying to sugarcoat or exaggerate or do something, I really want to just let you know what people are saying about your home, because you're not going to be there when they come through. I'm there not only when they come through, I'm following them up, I'm hearing what they like and they don't like, and I'm encouraging them to tell me if there's something that's holding them back, I want to know because I might be able to resolve that and then create a, a strong buyer out of them. But I think it's really important that you and I are on the same page. So I have a, a, 
I, I have a relationship with my clients where I just tell them exactly what people are telling me. If you're comfortable with that, I think it's the best way to go forward. 35 years, no one's ever said, no, 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 don't tell me the truth. Everyone says, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. So they're opening the door and they're embracing real conversation. The next thing is, and I call it real conversation, not tough conversation. And, and I understand where the tough bit and clearly there've been conversations that I've had in my selling career where they've kind of been at the tough end of the scale. But I think if you just see it is my job is to let the vendor know where the market's at. My job is to guide them in a direction so they make the right decision when the best possible offer comes forward. Part of that is I need to manage your expectations because the real world says they're probably going to want a bit more than the market is likely to yield. So I kind of need to manage them to make sure that they don't miss an opportunity. So people say that, and then you have the frequency, you've opened the door. And I said, so Tom, and the other thing is be specific. So Tom, I just want to run through. So we had six people through on the weekend and, and I'm probably doing most of this face to face, but nowadays it can be done zoom like this call it can be done on the phone. It really depends on the client and you and, and your time schedule on theirs. But so Tom, I just want to take you through the six people that came through. I'll, I'll leave two aside because it just wasn't for them. Um, they're looking, they've got a higher budget and they don't want to be on the, on the busy road as they called it. So kind of, I'll put them aside. The other four though, I think, there's a chance with a few of these. And let me just take you through how they responded to the property, what they liked, some of their concerns, which I'm trying to overcome with them. So I actually take them in detail. A lot of agents generalize things, Tom. They're saying, oh, Tom, so we had six people through. Yeah, it was really good. Um, look, feedback's between one, two to one, three. It's not at the one, four, one, five that you're after. And that kind of feels on the other side, I suspect, to the vendors like a conditioning tool. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to say, Here's what the Joneses said. Yeah, you know, they're, they're a buyer, Tom, but I've got to say, they're a buyer under 1.3. And obviously I've said to them that we're looking at a higher figure. And I asked them why they felt it was worth that. And it actually wasn't a budgetary constraint because they bid to 1.4 on another property. So they told me this. Here's what they said. They see they have to invest this to bring it up to the standard of homes that have been offered for 1.4 to 1.5. Therefore, they're kind of reducing that out of their purchase offer. Uh, or, or their feedback to me. And when you get specific and drill into real comments by real people and you break them down, you get a better reaction or response from the vendor than if you generalize. So if you do that all the way, and then I often people say, so how about the Joneses? They come back. And also I'm saying to them, so this is their concern. And, and I'll, if, if I've been able to do something to allay that concern or to change their view on it, so I might say, that's their concern. I've actually put them in touch with a draftsman that works in the area, you know, Bill Smith, up the road, because I think that if they, they could shift the floor plan and that could make it a home that's going to fit them. So I've connected them with Bill and they're having a conversation tomorrow with Bill. So that tells you what's happening transparently, but it also shows you that even kind of the conservative, negative, or, or, or people that are at a lower level they want to hear, I'm working with them, encouraging them. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with managing expectations. It, it's, it's, it's another tightrope. You just got to walk it. Not, not negative, not positive. It's just matter of fact, um, taking them in a direction. You're taking them on a journey with respect, with dignity. I'm not trying to like smash them. And, you know, as some agents say, oh, I'll kick them in the guts and tell them that's, that's all garbage. Mm -hmm. What you've got to do is, 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 you know, respect the relationship treat them with, with, with intelligence and sophistication and integrity, recognize they're probably going to want a little bit more. And that's fine. That's what every vendor, that's what Tom, when you go and sell your property and I go and sell mine, I'm going to want a little bit more than I probably think the market will pay. That's where we all start. And sometimes the lucky ones get to finish there and above. And most of the community ends up having to come back to a, a more realistic figure that the market's prepared to pay. I think, John, what you're sort of saying is they're paying you as a professional to interpret the marketplace. And if some of that interpretation of the marketplace is not what they wanted to hear, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be giving them that news. In fact, you've sort of got a bit of an obligation to be telling them um, the real truth. And some of that truth might not be desirable, but that truth may actually help uh, a lot of people from disappointment closer towards the end of the transaction, isn't it? Yeah, Tommy, Pete Chauncey, who's one of our best agents, he sold 30 properties in the month of October, November, for averaging 15 a month. Uh, he's got 83% market share, which is as good as I've heard. He, I interviewed him in a similar format to this to our own in-house team. And 
he said a couple of things. He said, I could see the market was getting really tough and I, I realised that I had to change what I was doing. Even though he was incredibly successful, he knew that things were tightening up and that vendors were kind of... It's actually a lot better now than it was because now most vendors going to market are committed, they're clear about what they're likely to get and, and they have a true purpose. There was a period like nine months ago where you had that overhang of people that were hoping to catch the end of the, the, the stronger mm. market at the previous prices and they're kind of having to adjust. So he was in that period and I said, so what did you do? He said, well, I, I figured that I would give people more detailed feedback at the end of the first week and the middle of the program before because the kind of things were generally going well. I didn't have to worry too much. And you know, normally, even if they're a bit optimistic, we'd get there eventually. He said, now from the first conversation I have with a buyer, I'm drilling in deeper and I'm having, I'm having the conversations I used to have on day 10 on day one, day two, mm -hmm. day three, day four, day five. So that was number one. The other thing is he had that kind of tough conversation um, experience and he said, you know, I just made a, a decision in my mind, which is what we call shifting paradigm. He said, I went from tough conversations to the reality that every vendor deserves to know the truth. Mm -hmm. And if someone gives me the key to their home, a check for $10,000 to market it, and the responsibility of maximizing their outcome and helping their family move, they deserve to know the truth. So when you kind of shift to that paradigm, every vendor deserves to know the truth, that just becomes the conversation. And there's mm. less hard conversation than there's just like, well, I'm just letting you know what you need. And he said, the way people responded was phenomenally positive. Yeah, sometimes they'd kind of like wince and, oh God, really? Is that what they're saying? Oh gee, I couldn't, nothing I could sell it at that. But it, the conversation would almost end up, oh, look, thanks very much. It's, it's, at least we know where things are at and we can make some decisions going forward. Some decisions were withdrawal, most of the decisions were, okay, well, the gap's still the same. If I'm moving to the Northern Beaches, their market's down, you know, 12% as well. And we're down 12. So the gap's the same. So I guess we just move, keep going. So, um, yeah, I think it worked really, really well. Okay. Johnny, I want to ask you if you were, if, if today was the first day that you were going back to work and you're, uh, you're, you're 25 years of age, it's your second or third year in real estate, you've had a great break, you've come back, um, you probably haven't been doing intermittent fasting, um, you've put on a few kilos over the break, you've come back to work um, and you don't have a high market share from last year in the marketplace, what are three things that John McGrath would be nailing in 2019 if he was uh, just a you know, newish type person in real estate? So, um, great, great, great question. What I would firstly do is I'd take responsibility for my current market share, low market share, and I would say, the reason I only sold 12 properties last year and I have 1% market share is me, nothing else. The way for me to get to 30% market share and sell, you know, 100 properties is going to be me. So what do I have to do? Who do I have to be? And what do I have to do to achieve that outcome? So right now I know you've got 12 sale a year habits and energy and product knowledge and process. I need you to shift that up. So first thing is you own, you own your results and you own where you're at and why you're there and you then have control to change that. So then I would say, okay, so what is my real goal for this year? Let's say 2X for the minute, 25 sales. Okay, that's gonna double my market share, double my GCI. It's a good starting point. And I should be able to go way, way beyond that. So then I kind of reverse engineer. So 25 sales means 30 listings means 75 listing presentations, call it that, assuming that I'm getting 30 out of 70 or you know 40% um, of my, my listings. So firstly, is that I've now got a plan. Simple, it's like the diet. It's like simple, keep it simple. It doesn't have to have 10 pages. It should have 10 bullet points. That's about all. One page, no more. So now I've got my plan for the new year. You should already be starting to get a bit energized. Big part of your plan is how do I be a better me? So then you start to look at, physiology, health, mindset, energy, networking, the things that are kind of obvious that you talk to your gym members about all the time. And, and so what is my plan around those areas? Talking to, I was coaching one of our agents this morning. He's a million and a half guy. And I said, what's your prospecting plan? And good guy, like a million and a half. He's seriously, he's in the top, you know, half a percent in the country, I would imagine. And it was kind of like, 
two out of 10. I, I said that to him. I said, geez, can I give you my assessment of that? He said, yeah. I said, what's two out of 10? And, and he looked at me and, and he kind of thinking, oh, shit, are you joking? I said, no, really. I said, that's the good news because you're doing a million and a half at two out of 10. Let me add to the other eight points you need to be doing. But the reality was he was achieving a pretty good result or a very good result without doing all the things. So what I did with him was break it down to, okay, what does 10 out of 10 look like? So let's look at that. What is a prospect list sell? Like they're the three key things. What is a 10 out of 10 prospecting plan? He was doing two activities out of 10. For me, there's 10 things you need to be doing. Layer, the layer upon layer, you need to be doing them well. He was doing two. So I said, let's just go through these and let's just break down the three most important ones and let's get you doing those like immediately. That's a good start. Then the next time we meet, we'll add another three in. And before the end of the financial year, we'll have you doing all 10 all the time. And it's not about doing all 10 occasionally. It's about doing them all consistently. So we kind of did that. Then I said, listing presentation, zero to 10, where are you at? And he said, uh, I reckon that's, I'm pretty good at that. I reckon I'm an eight. I said, okay. And actually what he said is I get eight out of 10. I said, okay, that sounds good. Let's call that an eight out of 10 listing presentation. For you to get to a nine, what would you have to change? And he was really good. He, he said, I said, if there were two things you had to change, he said, okay, I know those. He said, one is preparation, two is listening. I said, brilliant. You've just added another 25 sales a year. If you now do what it takes to become better at preparing for your listing, because a lot of people, by the way, yep, I'll be there tomorrow at three o'clock. That's their preparation. And they arrive and they might print out an RP data report and they arrive with the RP data. That's not that's a one out of 10 listing presentation. Anyway, you and I can talk about that at a, on another Zoom call with this group later. So that was, the second one was listening. He said, you know, I do listen. I do care what they say, but I probably tend to speak more than I listen. And I said, well, at a listing presentation, it should be like 75, 25, 75% listening, digging deeper, 25% making statements, making recommendations. And he said, yep, it's kind of got to swap because I'm 75% statement based. I said, great. Well, we've probably just had another 25 sales by those two things. So I would recommend everyone. And by the way, that was my first coaching session with him for the year. So it's very similar to answering the question is, what did you do last year? What is your goal for this year? What are you going to do differently? Prospect list sell, rate yourself zero to 10. How do you get up to that eight, nine out of 10 echelon in those three key skills? Um, and then all of a sudden you get this momentum, Tommy, as you know, you've experienced it, you know, you're living it. This is about, you know, like the energy you put out there is starting to yield better results. And all of a sudden with less effort, things start coming your way. They, they start being attracted into your energetic vortex and people start ringing you that you've had no connection with. No one's referred them. They just kind of feel your energy. So I, I think that's what I, I'd be doing. And, um, yeah, the, the, the physiology thing is important. So I don't want to go right back to the reinvent the diet thing, but what, you, what how you move your body and what you put into your body each day has a marked impact of how you are at your listing at 6 p.m. tonight. You put garbage in, you have sugar spikes, you know, you kind of, you, your belt's a bit untidy, you're wearing your old fat clothes because you can't fit into your nice thin clothes and, and you're not feeling as good about yourself and people aren't feeling as good about you because it looks like you're a bit disheveled. All those kind of, Again, micro messages that are really important. Yeah, you got to you got to look at those things. They're 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 really key. Jo Johnny, we said on a recent podcast we did with Troy, you said if there was um, some effortless um, hacks to grow your business, one of the big ones is um, commission. Your view of what you actually charge, and you actually, uh, I think, suggested that now is as good as any time in the world to make a decision to increase your fee. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's, it's a conversation we had this morning because that was one of his upgrades for this year was increase his commission. Um, so th th there's two things that will determine generally your commission, Tommy. It's what you ask for and how you respond if they ask for a discount. Yeah. You're never going to get 2.5% if you ask for 2%. So yes, you have to be aware at roughly kind of what seems to be acceptable in your market. In some markets, you know, the very best agents who are absolutely on their game don't get any more than 1.8. In other markets, it's 2.8. So kind of within the context of what is possible, you have to kind of be, be shooting at the top end. So here's what I find. When you give a great presentation and you deliver great value add advice and you've earned the listing and you ask for a fee, and it's the top end, but still within the realms of what people kind of expect, you're likely 50% of them will say, okay. 
50% of them will then say, yep, I like everything you've said, I'd like to run with you, but your fees are too high. So at how you respond at that point is really critical. And, and some people go to water and they say, oh, okay, well, gee, I'm glad you want to work with me. Uh, what would you be comfortable paying? Well, 1%, oh God, that's a little bit low. Um, could we do 1.2? That kind of stuff is going to bring your commission layer down. And by the way, when you do a great job, which you, you should and will anyway, well, no matter what you commission, um, you're going to be referred by people. Most people get most of their business from repeat and referral. And if, I, if, if, I, if you tell me to, to use uh, Pete Chauncey, and then one of the questions I'm going to say is, what sort of commission am I going to pay him? What's he going to ask for? What will he negotiate? And you'll say, oh, Tom, you know, John, you, know, you can get him down to 1.5. He'll do it at that. He'll, he'll tell you he won't, but I've got to tell you, he, he did mine at 1.5. So people will attach or, or be happy to disclose to a friend of theirs what they pay. <clears throat> so it's really important. And one of the best agents in the country is Ken Jacobs that sells... I think the last five years, he sold the top price in Australia every year, like $70, $75 million has been the last couple of years. James Packer's house, the Fairfax's house, um, all those things. Ken won't negotiate off 2%. And I've worked very closely with him. He worked with us many years ago, but I've stayed friends and I've done conjunctions since then. I've got to tell you, Ken doesn't negotiate on a $70 million deal, 0.1%. So if it's, it's Ken, $70 million, what's your fee? We're 2%. Is that the best you'll do? Yeah, I do all my deals at 2%. Wow, okay. Would you be prepared to negotiate on that? Yeah, I don't negotiate. And Tom, let me tell you why I don't negotiate. One is every single client that's used me throughout the history of my business has paid me 2%. And I respect that and I respect them. And I wouldn't disrespect them by them negotiating elsewhere and them hearing that I'm a discounter because I'm not a discounter. Two is I've structured my business in such a way that I maximise price and I deliver you the best outcome. And that, Tom, comes at a cost. And I structure it to do that. And, Tom, you're a business person. You know that it's expensive to run a business. And people think, wow, okay, you get that big commission so you earn it all. You know that's not the case. By the time you pay costs and marketing and all sorts of different things to do with your business, all of a sudden it comes down to a kind of a 10 or 20% figure, if I'm lucky, 25% as a margin. So... It's expensive to run a business that delivers. We don't cut corners. So that's kind of the approach, keeping it simple, but it's like one is, are you committed? Now, by the way, you can't say I've never discounted if that's not you. You, you have to kind of leave that. That's, that's real for Ken, but you've got to leave it out. But you can say, you know, Tom, I'll tell you why I don't discount my fee. I believe what's in your best interest is not getting a discounted rate up front. It's getting the best, uh, best price at the end. And the extra half percent to one percent that you'll pay me over the discount agents, the question, I guess the real question I have to answer and have to give you confidence in is, can I deliver you more than that one percent? Tom, I'm committed to getting five to ten percent more and I have case studies and examples that I'll talk you through that I believe absolutely, unarguably delivered my clients ten percent more than they would have got elsewhere in the market. So my approach to business is I don't discount, but I value add and I get you 5 to 10% more. Other people discount and they get the sale and it's a different approach and that's fine. There's, there's Louis Vuitton and there's Kmart and both are business models. I just happen to kind of go because my clients want the best outcome. My clients tend to have, with great respect, the best properties in the area and they, they would rather I spend more money getting them the best outcome than discounting and giving them a, a bare bone service. I'm sure you understand that. So... That now, by the way, that may or may not be exactly right for everyone on this call, but there is there is a considered, thoughtful response if you practice it that will be right for everyone on this call. So feel free to copy that. Feel free to copy Ken's if you can, but most people can't. Um, definitely encourage you to think through it. Is you know what is your position? What is your kind of bottom line? And you might want to be a Kmart. You might say, John. I'm happy to do deals all day at 1% because I kind of want to do volume. For me, that's a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. And there's always going to be someone that'll say, oh, you're doing a lot. You're doing it at 1%. So I'm now going to do about half a percent. And you kind of, it's a race to the bottom. So that's kind of not a game I want to play. I'd rather do the Ken Jacobs thing and, and, and give people great value add. Because by the way, I think it's a nicer way to do business. Now, the important thing, Tom, when you're doing it is again, your tonality can't be dismissive or disrespectful because then, you have to let people save face. So I'd say, Tom, that's a really great question. And by the way, 
most people or many people that, that engage my services, they ask that question up front. It's kind of comfortable. It's something that they feel they're obliged to do for themselves. Here's why I don't discount. So I kind of, you, you need to create an environment where you're very respectful with them. Yeah, you know, I've heard some people say, well, you know, what is it? You can't afford the fee. That's a kind of crazy way to get yourself marched mm -hmm. out of a, a lounge room. Yeah, you know, this is about, and, and, and very similar with marketing, Tommy. You know, marketing is very similar. I, I take a view. My philosophy is it's actually not in your best interest for me to pay. One is we don't pay for marketing. Um, two is I don't think it's actually in your interest if we, if we did pay for marketing. Here's why. And again, a lot of clients ask this question. So I think it's a totally natural question and I understand where you come from. Here's the reason that I believe it's, it's definitely not in your interest. Number one is focus. If I paid for some of my clients' marketing and other my colleagues in the office paid for some of that, in essence, you know, there's, a, there's a chance that we become a quasi debt collection company. That's not what we're in the game for. We're in the game for maximizing price. I don't think there's anyone better in the real estate industry that can get a better outcome for you and for the community than we do. So we focus very intensely with that. So it's important for me that I focus on the things that value add for you. Second thing is, it's about relationship. As I said earlier, Tom, this is about a teamwork and a partnership. My commitment to this partnership is I'm gonna work 24 seven and, until we get you the best outcome, until I get a sold sign up, and then I wanna create a client for life out of this relationship. This is not about a sales Ooh. transaction and me getting 2% and this is about how can I serve you and your colleague and your community for the rest of my life our lives. So I think it's really important that the relationship is on an equal foot, footing. So I'm happy to put in all the effort as long as it takes to get you the best outcome. By the way, if, if for whatever reason, through no fault of yours or mine, you decide to withdraw, I get nothing. I'm comfortable with that. I get nothing until I can get you a price that you're delighted with. So that's cool. That's my investment. Now the marketing side, I'm going to give you three programs that I think are great programs. They're three different price points. You have the ability to choose whichever one suits, the one that you have confidence in, and whichever one, Tom, you think suits your current budget. So I wanna tailor it so it works for you as well as for me and the property. The third thing, which I think is really important, you need to have the final say in marketing. And I know a lot of agents that, and there's, there's no doubt there's discount agents, as we discussed earlier, and there's no doubt that agents that'll pay on settlement, or some agents even bizarrely, don't pay, you don't pay at all. So there's plenty of discounters out there. Here's the problem with that. One is you get suboptimal, if not B grade marketing. You have very little say in that because you're not paying for it. With mine, we sit down together, we go through all the elements, I'll make recommendations, and at the end of that, you sign off on a program that you're comfortable with and you're confident in. When we do that, that for me is the ultimate relationship. So that's the way I'd go, that's the way I'd go about both fees and marketing. And, and sometimes you ought to handle one and not the other. Sometimes they're comfortable with the fee and they're not comfortable with the marketing. Sometimes you know, they're happy with marketing and not the fee. So you gotta work, but it's really an approach is what do you think you're worth? What are gonna be the likely objections? What is an intelligent response to those? What is your philosophy and walk away price? Because at some point, otherwise, they just keep saying, oh, well, someone will do it at 1.5, okay, I'll do it at that. Oh, I rang someone else this afternoon, they'll do it at one and a quarter. Yeah, okay, I'll match that too. At some point, it's kind of business you don't want. So Johnny, I, think, I, I, I can't help. You, you, you've been doing real estate for a long time and I'm sure the experience allows you to so easily to be having this natural conversation you've done a natural conversation on price you've done a natural conversation on fee a natural conversation on marketing and i mean i've got like about 10 of your videos in the real estate gym that breaks every subject and it's got you know dialogue a lot you know uh, well 10 hours of it which is a lot more than what we can cover here but i'm going to ask you this question do you think that it's natural, you were born this way, to be able to, in many ways, read the play. Like, I, I notice you read the play. Like, I'm sitting here, and you'll notice that I'll nod my head, and then you'll realise, shit, he wants to ask me something. You've got this incredible ability to pick up on cues. Do you think, if there's a girl or guy watching this, and they're saying, shit, you know what? It comes out of John's mouth so easily. 
I can't do that. I'm not born like that. What's your comments to that? So I know everyone on the call can get a lot better. That's what I do know. Can everyone on the call become the best on the planet? Well, by definition, no, but everyone on the call can get a hell of a lot better than they are. Number one. Number two is I know that I was not born to be in this game. I, I decided when I was 18 to get into this game and I decided when I got into it that I wanted to be the best possible agent that I could possibly ever be. And then what I know is I embarked on a series of activities that helped me build this ability to whether it's read the game or communicate. I was a woeful communicator in my teens. I was freckle face, pimply, kind of like curly hair, kind of, I, I had no confidence, whatever. I was the least person likely to be a salesperson at the end. I was good at sport, which gave me some self-esteem, thankfully. Um, but when it came to the social side of it, I was not confident. I then went and did a Toastmasters course. I then went to every Tom Hopkins seminar. I then brought Brian Tace, Tracy and Jim Rowan tapes, cassette tapes, as you would remember. Mm. And I kind of embarked on this kind of university of study. I then got a job with a guy called John O'Brien in a little company in Paddington in Sydney. And I just studied everything he did. And I asked him copious questions and I went to every listing presentation and I was a fly on the wall and I watched him how he spoke with people, what he said. And I did everything he told me. He said to me, you know, John, most of our clients are interested in art. You have to go and find out about art. So I went to Robin Gibson Gallery at Darlinghurst and I signed up as a member. And, and I used to go to every opening, partly to network, partly to find out about, you know, contemporary Australian artists. And I, and I got interested in that. And that kind of gave me something to talk about other than football, which was my natural default was to talk about football because I, that was where I came from. So, None, nothing that I've done is not being able to be replicated, and I'm sure it is by many, but your entire real estate gym can be replicating this. This is about a commitment to never-ending learning that's going to make you a better agent and, and a better person, more importantly. Um, the mooring line or, or the, the, the mooring line of the limiting belief is, oh, I'm not cut out for that. I, I'll, I'll be okay, but I'm never going to be scintillating. I'm saying, why not? Well, that's just, you know, not me. I'm not really good at talking to people. I said, so let's have a discussion about how you can get better at talking to people because I was terrible at talking to people. Um, but I practiced it and I, I got confident. Then I found myself engaged in good quality conversations. I still am shy as a networker. I go to networking events and I work the room and I meet people and I connect with people and I ask questions and I'm a great listener, but it wasn't a natural default. So I think you've, you've just got to, you know, as we, we talk about, Tom, you and I all the time, you've got to snap the mooring lines. You've got to get rid of the excuses. A bit awkward or I stutter a bit or whatever. It doesn't matter. None of those things matter. You know, you know Michael Pally, one of the best agents. Mm. The country, well, arguably probably the best agent, he and Alex Phillips are probably, uh, and Matt Steinway, the three of them would be neck and neck, I imagine, at the moment. But Mike Pallia, who worked for us in his first job in real estate, uh, and he's now writing phenomenal numbers um, and selling some of the best houses in Australia, he was a mechanic, motor mechanic in Wollongong. And he came to Sydney and he became a motor mechanic at Rolls-Royce, which is kind of his dream. And then his dream was to go from being a mechanic at Rolls-Royce to a salesman. And he did that successfully, became the number one Rolls-Royce salesman in Australia. And then he wanted to get into real estate. And then he came and worked with us. And, and you meet Michael. The, the guy is not what you call uh, silk smooth, he, but he's authentic and he's real and he's interested and he works hard and he's got great product knowledge. And he's writing like six, seven, eight, nine million bucks a year. I don't know what the number is. He, mm. he knows. I don't know, but it's a big number and it's right up there with the best in the country. So, you know, the question is, are you going to go from a motor mechanic in Wollongong to Australia's best real estate salesman or not? Because he has, mm. and, and he just mm. didn't have excuses. He just had like ambition followed by ambition and more ambition. If Michael could have said, Oh, I'm from Wollongong. I'll never get a job at Rolls Royce. Oh, now I'm just a mechanic. They'll never hire me as a salesman. Well, now I'm a Rolls Royce salesman, but I'm, he said, look, all the people I've serviced and given great service to over the years at Rolls Royce, they all own the best homes in, in the eastern suburbs. If I go into real estate, I can like, I've given them great. They know my integrity. 
they know that I care. They know I've delivered houses from them after it was uh, properties, after, I'm sorry, cars after it's been serviced to their property at nine o'clock at night. And then I've got the train back to Wollongong because that's what I had to do for a period of time. Um, so he, he knew that. So the question is, what is stopping you at the moment? And don't carry into 2019 the mooring line or the blockage that you had in 2018, because we all have some blockages, and but some of us are working on them and, and we're overcoming them. And, and other of us are just sitting there in the, the blockage mentality and we're, and we're not overcoming them. So the question is, as you start 2019, back to your very first question is, what are you gonna do differently? As I said to our guy this morning is, it's no point me just endorsing what you're doing because then you're just gonna keep getting what you've been getting. What I have to do is give you my insight. And I said, you know, do you go to the gym? He said, yeah. I said, how long have you been going? He said, five years. I said, do you have a personal trainer? He said, no. I said, well, if you hired a personal trainer that started tomorrow, you would have a different experience. A better one might be tougher to start with, but in 12 months time, you're gonna be a lot fitter because you're doing something at a different intensity, different exercises. Someone's pushing you. Someone's getting rid of your excuses. They're saying, no, another 10, another 10. Got a stretch, all this kind of stuff. What did you eat last night? They're kind of taking you to a higher level. So, and I know in your gym, you're doing a lot of this stuff. So people have to, stay on the path of this never ending learning stuff. Sorry, I don't know if we're over time, but it was- No, just... so, so John, on that point, cause I know in about five minutes, John and I and Troy are gonna do a podcast M MDA and I'd love you all to uh, uh, start listening to that. Um, John, I'm also gonna let people know that this content and Matt Steinway and Adrian Bowe and Gavin Rubenstein and all the great agents I've been interviewing over the last few years, that content is sitting in the real estate gym and I deliberately picked today knowing that for every person here, they are officially like Australia Day's open, over, yes, the tennis hut is finished, there's no reason now not to be 100% full on and this is the week that I'm closing the real estate gym for 2000, well sorry, I opened it up again in June but this week I'm closing it. Anyone that wants to uh, join please go to realestategym.com.au. I'll have Susan put the link in the comments. Also, our gym members, John, are going to see you on the 13th of February. We've got a live kickstart, which you've always been very, very kind enough. Of the, you know, and when I say kind, it's like you don't come along and say, here is your stuff but the real good stuff I actually keep in my pocket for my own people. You've always had the approach that um, good things happen when you give your best all the time. When you do your best all the time, regardless who the audience says, regardless who the people are. So I'm grateful for that, John. And you've always been like that, eh? Hey? You've never been someone that, hey, I'll keep the good stuff for, uh, for something else. Well, Tommy, I know that the things, the, people, the things that people shared with me, the ideas, the strategies, the tips, if you will, over the years, are what allowed me to gather momentum and, and, and create a great life. For me to not share that would be kind of like a weird breaking of the karmic circle and just makes no sense to me. So my, my view is that you have to share that generosity is a trait that, that is attractive to people and transparency and authenticity. And, and I don't look down upon people that do keep their secrets. That's their prerogative. I just find that, you know, one day we're all going to be gone in a box somewhere and, and and why would we want to think that we kept all our best ideas to ourselves that just doesn't feel or even oh, a small circle around us we kept our best ideas that just doesn't feel like it's going to value add change the world um so yeah i, I think it's you know and, I, and this is your life this is my life we love sharing ideas and the best way to reinforce in yourself what's important is by sharing teaching uh coaching with people so I get every time I meet with you and Troy and every time I go to one of your events or speak at one of our events, I'm, events it, it, it's a part of my own education is just to mm. keep that flow going. And it also makes me responsible to have to keep learning and getting better because if you and I were saying the same thing we said 10 years ago, I've got to tell you, no one would be listening. Mm. So the fact that you've grown such a big audience and it continues to grow um, it, it, it's only, it's a testament to you because this is about we're continually reinventing and you and I keep challenging ourselves about ideas and sharing ideas and we text each other at bizarre hours and saying, this is a great post, this is a great article and, and that what makes it fun. I, I can't fathom what it would be like to kind of think you've made it and then just sit in, in cruise control. You kind of want to 
you want to be learning and I can't wait to find out what I'm going to learn and what I'm going to discuss next. But anyway, I'm looking forward. So 13th, where is that at? Uh, 13th? 13th, it's in Sydney. Uh, you're doing the Sydney one. I've got other people around the country doing other ones that are in other cities, like for instance, you know, Phil Harris and, you know, Matt Lancashire and, you know, David Ding in Auckland. So uh, guys and girls, I'll see you at the Kickstarts. If you're not a real estate gym member, join. It's, uh, I think it's it's it works out to being about 10, 11 bucks a week. Susan's got the link there. We'll see you at the kickstarts, John. We're going to get off this call now, and we're going to get on to our do our our podcast with uh, with Troy Malcolm, who has to be Australia's best AV technician. That's also now become a fantastic uh, trainer and auctioneer. And John, again, thank you. And I've got to say, like, I, you know, because I know that this is going to get about 30,000 views on social media. I'm going to thank you, John, because I had, I had a terribly challenging year last year, right? I had both my health and the loss of my brother. And it's two big events in, in one year, right? It would have been, I, w I wish they were in separate years because it's a lot easier to handle, you know, one shit thing uh, in one year and then do another. But, you know, one of the things is that I realize when you're in, when you fall down, one of the most useful things that can keep you going is the input of people that care about you that give you hope that your current situation is not permanent, right? That your current situation is temporary and that things are going to get better. And, and, and having people like that on your side shapes your mind because sometimes the thing you say to yourself, sometimes when, when you're in a rut and you think to yourself, how, how things can get just, things are pretty shit. They're fucked. I can't see light at the end of the tunnel conversations transformation can happen in conversations can't it john you know uh, the right conversation and, and and tell me whether it's business or personal challenges you're right you have to have a team around you not necessarily a paid team but you want to have the right people with the right energy and the right intent on your side and, and you know I, I don't do it because i feel any compulsion to have to i do it because i love you very much and i do it with all the people that i love and i want to help them and 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 they do the same with me. So, you know, you're right, 100%. And it's, it's taking, the other good thing, is, the other important thing is it takes the focus off yourself and, and mm. you're now focusing on helping others, which is a far better energy to have mm. about what's the next car I can buy, how much can I put in the bank this afternoon, all that. I'm not saying anything wrong with that stuff, but I'm just saying it's, it's a far greater life when you can contribute to others. So that's kind of part of a philosophy. But no, no, well... Let's make 29 the best year and let's share it with your uh, gym members. And, and look, I endorse, this is not a paid advertisement, but for 10 bucks a week, seriously, anyone that doesn't want to be a part of this, and I know there's many people that are doing this that have gone through the roof with their numbers. And this is exactly the sort of habitual learning that's critical. So yeah, sign up for it and I'll see you on MDA podcast in a few minutes. Yeah, someone's just put a comment here. Do the podcast right here on Zoom. And Amanda, we're not going to do it right here on Zoom because I'm not going to have Troy Malcolm appear with me and John here. We'll do that. We'll do that offline. I'm not going to have any strengths of Troy Malcolm. He's always, John, he's always, he's got that blue suit. He's got his tie. His hair's perfect. He's, you know, always looking sharp. No, 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 no. We're going to do it on audio. <laughs> But listen to it this week, Amanda. It'll be coming out soon. All righty. Thank you so much, Johnny. I'll talk to you soon. To all our audience, I want to thank you so much for the biggest, the biggest compliment you can give us in a world that there's so much content. You've given us an hour of your time. I really appreciate it. John, thank you so much.